This is it, people. We're now down to the last lecture. And we're talking about LRFD methods and specifically the Ashto LRFD method. And, um, but before we get to the actual Ashto method, I think we need to lay down a little bit of background about what LRFD is about. In when I mentioned file dynamics about David Victor Isaacs, uh, the Australian who first documented the wave equation in piles. And he talked about, one of the things he talked about are factors of safety and on top of that a factor of ignorance. And to some extent the whole purpose of LRFD is to try to figure out what the factor of ignorance actually is using probabilistic considerations. And uh, my principal source of this is the current driven pile manual from the FHWA. The reason why I picked it is not just because it's the driven pile manual, but because uh, it brings out a full explanation of LRFD from behind the Ashto paywall which and, and I'm a person that essentially dislikes paywalls of any kind um, so um, anyway that's what we're, we're we're bringing it out against and we can um, and, and that's why I've um, it, it, um, that, that's why I'm using that particular reference until the 19, early 1970s, all civil engineering design was done using ASD or allowable stress design. Uh, the transition uh, for superstructures was pretty much complete by the mid 1990s, and that's why we have the last, for example, steel book um, with strictly ASD was the ninth edition, and I think that was in the late 80s. Uh, all of them since then have been in both systems, and um, we see both systems still in use on that. Uh, the transition to load resistance and factors on LRFD uh, began about that time. Geotech has always lagged in many ways. In, in, some, in a few ways, it's got ahead of it, like the wave equation. But generally speaking, Geotech has been content to lag behind the rest of it. There are so many uncertainties in the ground and in in um, our understanding of, of how it behaves that we've always preferred to take a more conservative approach and as a result it took longer to get RFD accepted in geotech and we started geotech and i think the first the fhwa's first lrfd manual was in 1998 um, and it's proceeded. The, the, and I mentioned it. I don't mention the um, uh, FHWA lightly because they have largely um, promoted using LRFD in geotechnical calculations. They've done it probably more than any other group of people. They and Ashto um, in the United States. So that's why we have it. It's a um, the problem, the reason why, the obvious question is factors of safety worked all these years. Why do we do it? Um, it doesn't take account of the variability of loads and resistances. The problem, the biggest weakness with ASD as we have used it is that it doesn't, it, you know, it, there are many things. It doesn't really, not very good with unusual events. It um, doesn't... Um, uh, it doesn't separate the variabilities in loads and resistances, and um, that's an important consideration. Uh, for example, you know, in re retaining wall design and, and, and uh, retaining wall slope stability, um, all of your failure surface types of 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 um, loads, we have the the. Um, the resisting forces over the driving. So we've separated those two, and as a result, um, 
you know that's their their fact you know and also obviously they are not the same and we can match different ways of resisting with different ways of loading it does not involve a reasonable measure of strength um, well I, I think maybe that, that I'm not sure whether the implementations we have now have really done a very good job of moving that football down the field. Um, lacks is subjective, is actually subjective in terms of the probability of failure. We're trying to take what we, you know, one of the things that you hear people say is we used to divide, to design things deterministically and now that we do it probabilistically. But the truth is, is that we've been designing things probabilistically from the very beginning. Um, there is no design that we have done that has an absolute guarantee against failure. And we're going to see that in the number. LRFD, the one advantage it does give us is that it actually puts some hard numbers to that and enables us to do things with failure that we did not do before but in the process and to try to make the math on it as simple as possible and to be real honest that's not very it's one reason why this is the last lecture in the course the advantages of lrfd is that it counts separately between loads and resistances um, it achieves a more consistent levels of safety um, and does not rely or not, on knowledge of probability or reliability theory. Um, it does, you don't apply statistical analysis to stuff. Um, it has been a challenge for a profession that has kind of lived and died on ASD for a long time. Um, they The resistance factors vary with design methods are not consistent. We've had the, there's been a lot of work done on trying to um, make the resistance factors consistent with what was actually happening. The last major challenge is that rigorous calibration of the load and resistance factors um, requires the availability of statistic data and probabilistic design algorithms. There are two issues to this. Uh, the, big, well, the biggest issue is that in geotech it's not the... Uh, how do I put this? The, um, getting to getting a consistent standard of failure, particularly in service requirements, but even strength requirements is not always easy. Um, and of course, we, we saw this with, for example, with static load testing, you've got more than one definition of failure. It, it's difficult to get a consistent statistical uh, result when you've got so many different criteria you're working against or, or criteria with so many variations and that's been a, a challenge uh, the result of that uh, was that um, the result of that is that in the early years of LRFD and uh, we basically took ASD calculate you know, ASD factors of safety and back figured them into LRFD and I remember one year at the civil engineering meeting, um, the, um, the, the this concept was presented, and Jean Louis Briot, who is now our incoming ASCE president, point asked the question, "Well, what's the point in LRFD?" Well, since that time, we've um, that was a legitimate question at the time, and it's one that's been answered by some statistical studies. However, in the in the de developing the factors, uh, we have to be very careful how we use the data, uh, particularly in geotech, because of the non-uniformities in in the in the way and where we define things, and from one to the other, and from one job to the other, and from one jurisdiction to another. So we have to be. Statistics are a marvelous thing, but. They not only can be manipulated, but in some cases, they they can end up doing apples to oranges comparison that really don't teach us anything. The basic design approach 
is this. Uh, it's governed by this equation. The sum of all of the loads plus all of the load factors is must be less than and equal to the resistance factor times the resistance. And um, as a result, the load factors are usually greater than 1, and the resistance factors are usually less than 1. And we have this nice chart here where we have unfactored nominal loads. We need to make a clear distinction between factored and unfactored. We start with unfactored nominal loads. We factor them up to factored load effects, and we frequently can also use that to combine loads. And those loads can be moment loads, they can be all kinds of loads, as we're going to see. Uh, axial loads, lateral loads, that kind of thing. And on the other side, we have an unfactored resistance, which is reduced to a factored resistance. And as long as the factored resistance is greater than or equal to the factored loads, we're, we're good with LRFD. And that's the basic concept. If, it's, it, if it was, they stayed that simple, it would be an easy thing. But it's, unfortunately, it's not. And some of that is due to, particularly on the load side, is due to the, to the complex nature of loads. If we have loads and resistances, we can, um, we, we, if we assume a bell curve distribution, I'm not going to justify that assumption or not. I'm just going to, we're just going to assume it. It's, it's generally not a bad way to start. What we have a situation on the uh, load side where we have a peak here and then we can have loads going either direction, but they're most probably going to land here. And then on the resistance side, we have another belt distribution, but they normally right here. And basically... The problem is with this kind of distrib these two distributions, there is no such thing as a area where there is an absolute certainty that what we have, what the, that the resistances will be greater, the factored resistances will be greater than the factored loads. Instead, what we do, and we have this failure region, you know, we, we define a failure region and a quantity beta. So, for example, um, if we have the reliability of beta, the probability of failure is 1 in 10, and say we go up to 4.1, it's 1 in 100,000. So, therefore, the more we can separate the load and the resistance, th these curves, this way, the less likely the design is to failure. But there is no absolute guarantee against failure. Another fact thing that complicates the issue is the fact that some failures are more likely than others. Uh, and for example, we say have a, an ex, an ex, you know, we have an actual consequences of failure, which go from the trivial to the um, the, to the disastrous, and then we, against the, the probability of failure. Fortunately, um, and most of the um, the, the probability, uh, most fortunately, the less the less the more probable a failure is, the lower its consequence. As a general rule, it's not an ironclad rule. In a lot of the extraordinary events we have these days, I've kind of skewed that a little bit. But the actual probability, and, as long, and our, the idea behind that, as long as we can keep it below, certainly below this, and possibly below this, we'll be okay. This below this is accepted. This is a marginally accepted, and so therefore, um, we have to consider the fact that many of the most severe events that can strike a structure are also the least likely. And we have to include that in our calculations as well. There are all kinds of loads, as I said, for substructure design. These use the, and now we're kind of transitioning into the AASHTO system. And the AASHTO system basically assigns a two-letter code. Well, we've seen that before. Um, 
two different types of failures. So example, DC is a dead load, and then um, LL is a vehicular, so for example, a vehicular live load, which is what we normally have in transportation projects. And we've got all other kinds of codes. And you see by this on this bridge that we have loads that are both axial or vertical. And we also have loads that are horizontal as well. And these loads, and by the way, one of the things you probably have noticed is a lack of moment load. And actually, indirectly, there is the moment load. It's just that it, it's not direct. For example, if you have a wind load, which you have with um, WS, for example, you're going to, if you blow something like that on side, you're going to get moment which will express itself usually in, in one side will be in tension and one side, side will be in compression. So you do have that as well. So we have Ashto's load designation. These are the, the permanent and transient loads as, are as follows. Um, the nominal resistance, this particular kind of spells out in a little more detail. The nominal resistance is equal to, or the factored resistance is equal to the phi, which is the factor resistance factor times the resistances. And actually, uh, and, and then those would be greater than the sum of the loads. Usually on the resistance side, we talk about one resistance. Sometimes, sometimes we will have more than one. Um, and then on the other side, we have um, the gamma, which is the load factor, and the Q, which is the load. Now, there's one thing, there's one catch that Ashto puts in and that we described over here. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this course on this particular, our load modifiers. Load modifiers, ductility, redundancy, or operation classification, these are additional uh, factors applied, applied to the force effect. Um, and, um, you know, that kind of, th that sort of thing. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on those. Most of those are, you know, not that great of a variation from what we have there. Obviously, in the actual design, you will use them. Um, but for, for our purposes, for educational purposes, we're going to kind of pass over those. And I said, for a structure to be sound, the resistance must be greater than or equal to the effect of the loads. Now we need to define a limit state. We see this term in, um, in, in the, in the ASHTO specific, in, in, in specification. A limit state is the condition beyond which a structural component can see, uh, see such as a foundation or other bridge going to cease to fulfill the function for which it was designed. And um, the reason why it's that broadly is because we have strength limit states, which as we've seen are largely, are usually associated with catastrophic failures, um, and service limit states, which are normally associated with settlement. And um, both, either of these can render a structure uh, unusable. It's just that with service limit states, that tends to be a more subtle process and sometimes takes longer. But the, the, the process of making a structure more um, you know, unusable is the, it, basically the result is the same. These are the limit states in the Ashto specifications. There are five strength states. Um, they, um, you can read which, what, what they represent. Um, there are two extreme event states, uh, load combinations, including the earthquakes. There is a service state. There are four of those. And these are all dependent upon different conditions which the structure is designed for. And fatigue one and fatigue two, they're two fatigue states. 
Now the obvious question is which one of these states is critical? And the answer to that question is it depends. It depends upon the on the whole way the structure is loaded. We're going to concentrate our focus. Again, what we're trying to do here is to get you up to speed and proficient with the way in which these are calculated. Um, I'm going to try to instead of, uh, you know, it's easy to get bogged down in detail with this method. Very easy. And it's it, it's really to teach it. We're going to we're going to focus in on our strength states and our service states. But the calculation method to determine which one is the most important is the same. And in fact, the whole goal behind this is to find out what of which one of these limit states actually is going to drive the design of the of whatever structure we're trying to design. What, you know, we ask the question, you know, which, which of these is most important? We are able, using LRFD, to actually find out which one is the most important. Now we can turn to the actual strength and service load factors and get an idea how to apply them. We have, you'll notice across the top of this, there are different the different two letter codes uh, a large part of the two letter codes are concentrated in the first two and therefore these factors are the ones we're going to concentrate on these load factors right in these first two columns and the rest of them they're important obviously but we're going to let them go for a minute now the uh the first, how do we use them well we use the, I mean, summation, of, I'm going to skip ahead to get to get to that. Basically, what we do is we take the first load factor for the, the dead loads, and I want to talk about the gamma thing in a minute, times the dead loads, plus the load factor for the DD loads, and times those, plus the load factor times the DW loads, plus the load factor the EH loads, and so on, all the way down here. And this is strength limit state one, which is the load across the top. And that's how we do it. We take this load factor, multiply it by this load, and then the next load factor times, you know, the same, you know, these are the same. And we go all, we go right across and we add them up. Now, a few things. It's possible that the loads will not be in the same direction. They may be positive and they may be negative. They may be moment loads. I talked about there's a way of getting around, you know, there are ways of getting around moment loads. Sometimes we have to deal with moment loads, particularly if we've got a beam of some kind. Then we have a moment load. And we have um, a moment load, and then, um, or we have a lateral load, which turns into a moment load, like we did with lateral loaded piles. Or we have some kind of, of, um, which is more of a structural type of thing, but it can be applied here as well. We have, uh, uh, but in any event, as long as, you know, the loads can be in different directions. That's significant because, you know, really this is fairly straightforward. You know, 1.75, for example, in, in strength one, means if I have a lateral load of, say, f um, 100 kips, then I have a factored, you know, LL, excuse me, lateral load, I'll back up, a live load of 100 kips. And then multiply it by 1.75, I'll have a factored live load of 175 kips, which I add to the rest of them. Oh, that's terrific. That's good, except, you know, for if, if, if it were, they were all just numbers there, it would be a lot simpler. The tricky part comes in with these gammas, and I, I tried to put this off as a, the gammas are, for example, present in these types of loads, and there's also over here. What are they? Basically, Ashto's provision gives you load factors, uh, has a provision for load factors that can vary across a range. For example, the strength one can vary from a minimum of 0. 
nine to a maximum of one point two five on the D, on, for DC load for composite. Um, in, for, it, however, if it's strength four, then it's point nine to one point five. Uh, there are other load factors which we have which have the possibility of varying. Well, how do you deal with that? Um, is that important? It's, uh, you know, why don't we just use the maximum load factor and, and go for it? Well, uh, if all the loads are in the same direction, you can pretty much do that. Uh, where these come into play is if you've got loads in different directions. If you do that, then it's entirely possible that the uh, maximum is not the worst case in a certain situation. So that's why that you have very it, it pays to check that um, is to make that routine to check out. So what you have to do is you have to check and see which load factor in that range, usually, usually it's one end or the other, is the worst. Uh, honestly, you know, in terms of finding out the absolute worst, you know, it, by, by looking at all the ones, you just about have to use a um, optimization technique to, to find that out. Um, a load strength, you know, and then that gives you a nice example of how you actually take those um, for state strength like state one, which is important in our calculations and computing and, and computing the factored lo overall factored load and we have this example i would strongly suggest that you take this example or at least one or a couple of rows of it and um uh and actually put these in a spreadsheet i would not do these without a spreadsheet to be honest with you uh, that's a fairly long equation right there, so you know that, that gets pretty that can get pretty old after a while, especially if you have to vary that load factor on the first column, which you normally do. Basically, the way that what I would suggest you do is to sit down with this example. This example has a bridge, you know, the structural at a button at, at the abutment one, the factored axial loads. Uh, it, it shows you what loads are there. The way it does this is the following. You have all these load factors here. This is the same table we had before. And then we had, we've got two sets of axial loads. We have the axial loads based on the abutment and the ones at the pier. You take, um, basically what you do is you take uh, the actual, uh, the axial loads and you then, um, multiply them by this factor and you do that all the way across and you get a, a total load um, at the end. And you do the same thing for strength two, strength three, strength four, strength five. You do the same thing and you just add up. And then that can give you, for example, for the first one, the strength one's case is the worst. It's the highest of them. For the extreme cases, this is the one, uh, the extreme one is the worst. And so that's how you, and I would suggest there's really no way to go through that. I would suggest that you just sit down and try to replicate these calculations by hand or preferably on a spreadsheet to figure out how it's done. It's the only, it's the best way of learning. Um, but you see what you get, you end up with, is a series of strength loads, and a series of extreme event loads, and a series of service loads, and extreme a series of fatigue loads, and then you take those loads, which are actually embedded in these in these sheets. You multiply, go potentially take these, go through these factors, and end up with that. That's what you're doing. That's how you compute the factored loads. Um, selection of resistance factors depends um, on the resistance factors is the variability of the soil and rock properties. Uh, the resistance factors have been a subject of a lot of um, 
back and forth in in the in in the profession about these uh, reliability equations used for predicting resistance, the quality of construction workmanship, never underestimate that, uh, extent of soil exploration and consequences of a failure, all enter into the resistance factors you use. You calibrate engineering judgment, reliability theory, or fitting to ASD that I talked about earlier. Resistance factors have probably been the harder side of LRFD to, to quantify in geotech because of the problems I've mentioned earlier. Um, for example, with uh, driven piles, you have resistance factors depends entirely on what method you use. It's just like the ASD. If you remember the ASD, the better the verification method, for example, the lower the factor of safety. Well, resistance factors are kind of the opposite. The better the um, verification method, the higher uh, the, the resistance as a general rule. And then you simply multiply that times whatever resistance that you have, and sometimes you get more than one. Um, same, you have the same thing here. Um, Another set of resistance factors. And again, this is the field determination thing I was talking about. If you can design, if you can, obviously with um, field determination, you can obviously improve your situation by um, static load testing. You see, this is, like I said, this is about the ideal. Design by successful static load test and dynamic testing at least two piles per site condition but no less than two percent of the, the production piles and we talked about that with files but you notice that that is much higher by a factor of two actually than many of the factors are just taking a static method and using it or this the same over here so therefore your verification and testing is crucial to improving your confidence in the design. Let's look at an example. LRFD driven pile example. Um, we're going to start with the load side, loose SM sand and water table, 14 inch square concrete pile. We're going to talk about DD and, um, and LL loads, just dead axial loads and live axial loads. That's it. We're just, we're just going to stick with those. Pile length that will develop sufficiently large resistance load to meet the LFD requirements. Uh, settlement in a service one load and consider strength one through five cases in service one case. We could consider them all. We're just going to focus on that. And when you read your problems, make sure you know what cases that we're looking for. Um, we're going to use a beta method, which is basically what Felenius had, uh, and it's also pretty much what we use with Tamway. I'm going to use Tamway. Um, first of all, but I got, I got ahead of myself. I got ahead of myself. Um, I do that. Some, usually I'm ahead of the slides. The slides got ahead of me. First, I have to figure out what is my factored load. I already, see, I'm already forgetting that. I'm going to forget what's my factored load. I'm so enthusiastic about getting to the resistance, I'm forgetting my factored load. Um, I had to, It's good to mention that I'm going to use TamWave as opposed to uh, it just saves a lot of calculations. All right, I've only got two different columns I'm really interested in. And because the loads are unidirectional, um, I can use the gamma factors on the maximum side. Because I know if they're all the, by unidirectional, they're all in the same direction, my maximum, if I use the maximum gamma factor, that's going to give me my maximum result. So therefore, I take, for example, the first one, the strength one, I need to point over here. Uh, 187.5 is, is equal to a, a this, the DD, 150 times 1.25 gives me 187.5. And ditto for the second one and the third one. Then the um, 1.5 times 150 is 225. And then we're back to those. For service one, 
is a factor of unit. That's and the, which is not unusual, by the way, with service loads. Um, not unusual at all. Now, with the live load, I take 100 kips times 107. 1.75 and I get that. I take 100 kips times 1.35, I get 135. I take 100 times 0, I get 0, and so on. Then what I do when I'm done with all that, I take that, I add these to my service, my strength 1 uh, factor load is a 3862.5. And the, you see the rest of them are smaller than that, and the service is 250. Well, uh, so the service load is lower, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it, that service failure won't happen. Um, but strength, but now you've got a full, complete, the governing load for strength is 362.5, and obviously the government for service, in our case, is 250. If I wanted to go complete, I'd, I'd add all those service loads up. I, I would compute all service loads and pick the biggest one. That's what you're doing, is you take all those and pick the largest one. Um, Okay, so that's pretty much how you do that. And if we restrict ourselves to two types of loads, and we will, the calculations are fairly straightforward, but I still recommend you always use a spreadsheet for this. On the resistance side, now I'm getting that. Now that I've computed my factor load is three, um, 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 is, is, three point, is 0.35. I simply take the factored resistance and divide that by phi. And if you look at the equation, the summation is equal to phi times the resistance. If I go under that, then the factored resistance is 1036. If I use TAM wave and I just vary the length without varying, I could also, by the way, I could either vary the length or I could vary the pile size. If I just vary the length of this thing, then I get the pile length comes to 130 foot. And that's a strictly a geotechnical. That doesn't take into account of your structural or anything like that. In order for this thing to work, I need for, uh, for the, from the strength standpoint, using Tamway, the pile length comes to 130 feet. Now, on the service side, service load is 250 kips. The required resistance is 250 divided by 0.35 is 714 kips. What I compare that to? Well, um, there's a, there, what I have to do is basically find out how much, uh, how, what my pile head deflection is at that, res, at that particular uh, resistance. And based on the load test, on, on the internal load test of the um, of the program, the pile load is approximately 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, and we could sharpen that a little bit later in interpolation, but really it doesn't do us a lot of good in this case. The question is, is 1.1 1 .1 acceptable? As I said before, it entirely depends on the job. It seems to, to, seems to be a a very large deflection and you probably you know if say for example if you're you've been told that half an inch is all we can stand then um, you're probably looking at that then it's not acceptable you'll have to find some way of reducing that resistance either by going longer still with the pile go to a larger pile whatever to find out what your um, Um, to find out what exactly what deflection you really need to have and um, I would say that uh, and of course it also depends upon um, your you know whether it's total or differential if you it's just kind of like that job I talked about with the uh, large or with the large uh, or or vats um, they were all supposed to go five foot down, but they went down total settlement. If your differential settlement is 1.1 inches, you may have, you probably got a serious problem. So, so therefore, there again, the, the, this gives you an answer, but you have to compare that answer to what your structure needs in terms of 
dimensional stability of its foundation in order to succeed. It may work, it may not. Well, that's it. Um, we've uh, come a long way. Glad you stuck with me on it. Um, I've, as you probably noticed, I've video edit all of these uh, lectures. Um, I don't just blabber and then post. I, I video edit, which helps some. Um, and I've had to listen to a lot of myself talk. And let me assure you, when I was a kid, I had a we had a family cat, a Siamese cat. They tend to be loud. And we always used to say he liked to hear the sound of his own voice. Well, I can assure you, I don't. And I'm sure that you're probably tired too. So, as the Egyptian theologian Origen would say, this um, course having reached a sufficient length, we will bring it to a close. Thanks for watching and God bless.